Welcome back to the Marshall Center Voices. I'm Valbona Zanelli. Today, we'll interview Dr. Andrew Mikta, the Dean of the College here at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. Dr. Mikta is a well-known political scientist with a long career in government, academia, and think tanks. He has been the Dean of the College at the Marshall Center since 2016, and he's a prolific writer on matters related to national security. In this conversation, we'll focus on the topics of great power competition, transatlantic relations, and European security. Due to the COVID restrictions, we'll conduct the interview in two separate offices. Dr. Mikta, welcome to the Marshall Center Voices. We're delighted to have you with us today. It's great to be here, Val. Thank you. Let me start with the first question. We hear a lot about great power competition, and you have written extensively on this topic. So what is new about great power competition now, and how would you describe this very complex subject? Great power competition has never gone away. Uh, we have simply uh, failed to notice what was happening around us. For about 20 years, we talked ourselves into a false sense of security as we were preoccupied with other issues, economic, transnational security threats. In the meantime, China and Russia, uh, they are now uh, on the rise again, and they're challenging the United States and the collective West uh, to lead the international system and to push us aside. Was it Ukraine and Crimea in 2014 that woke us up, or was it the global financial crisis in 2008-2009? In strictly military terms, it was indeed Ukraine that refocused us on the challenge of great power competition. But in reality, in the economic arena, we should have seen what was coming already in 2008, and maybe even before. I'm talking about the deindustrialization of the United States, the transfer of assets to Asia and China, and the rapid expansion of the Chinese economy. Well, to no surprise, you mentioned Russia and China, and I want to talk about China. In your opinion, what are the key elements that make China a security challenge? China is an existential challenge to the United States by virtue of its size, population, by virtue of its location, by virtue of the size of its economy. Uh, in purchasing power parity, Chinese economy today uh, is already bigger than uh, the U.S. economy, even though nominally it is still smaller. Uh, but most importantly, China is intent on building its own imperial project built in Eurasia and changing the way the West interacts with China and interacts with Asia in general. This is an existential challenge to the United States. We have never confronted a near peer adversary whose GDP was greater than 40 percent of America's. This is completely new. So how do you see China's long-term ambitions and how would you package those for policymakers? The most important thing we have to understand is that China is building a land-based empire across Eurasia. That's Belt and Road Initiative. That's 17 plus one. Efforts to make Europe and the United States, Africa, frankly, the rest of the world, the tributaries to this new Chinese imperial power in Eurasia. Uh, this will impact every aspect of our lives. If China succeeds, the, our idea of how countries organize themselves, whether democracy remains the paramount aspired to form of government, all of these issues will be put into question. This reminds me that in one of your pieces, you describe China's promise as a free market for unfree people. If left unchecked, how will this affect the global economy? We have forgotten that China is in effect a communist state. It's a country run by the Communist Party. In effect, a nation of 1.4 billion people is controlled by a political party of 90 million, but de facto its central committee and top leadership. The Chinese are offering a new model of organizing a society and a state. They're offering us a model whereby you can engage in, in free markets and benefit from them with considerable engagement of state power. There is a mercantile element to Chinese economic policy. But at the same time, individual freedoms and liberty are going to be pushed aside, if not completely eradicated. This is the nature, the essence of Chinese ideological challenge to the free world. So are we saying, are you saying that we should focus more on ideological challenge in the future? We should understand that 
ideology is an integral component of what is happening now in this new round of great power competition. Uh, the Chinese are offering not only the argument that their economic system is better organized, more efficient, more creative, that it's more productive, but they're also arguing that they can offer stability, uh, both domestically and when it comes to the international system, uh, unlike they claim the United States or the collective West. They're positioning themselves, Russia does it to some extent as well, but the Chinese are positioning themselves as a status quo power, as a power that wants to simply continue for the system to move forward as it has been. But in reality, that quote unquote status quo play is anything but, it is aimed at displacing the United States as the preeminent power of the democratic world. You have written about how short-sighted the Western community has been on transferring intellectual property and technologies to China. You're also a proponent of hard decoupling. What do you have in mind exactly? And is that viable considering the current level of economic globalization? We have not only allowed Chinese researchers, scientists, graduate students, unfettered access to our scientific and technological base, but we have taken entire manufacturing chains, alloys, processes, technological uh, excellence that actually took generations to develop, and we handed it over to our sworn adversary in order to produce for the global market or the American market out of China. In the process, the Chinese have rapidly modernized, leapfrogging what would have taken them generations uh, to develop, and they're now in a position to dominate different areas of technology and to challenge the West, especially the United States, for supremacy when it comes to cutting edge research and development. Even in Europe, there was a lot of talk about nearshoring. Do you think we have learned the lessons from the crisis or in the future, we'll just go back to business as usual? I'm afraid we have not. If you look at the data right now, over 80% of European and American companies seem to remain committed to manufacturing in China. And that's very different from what you see in Japan. The Japanese actually have a program to bring back a significant portion of their industry uh, back on shore to Japan. Um, I think we need to have a very serious national conversation about national security priorities, not simply look at labor arbitrage or, or the costs of manufacturing per se. There are some areas where we have to have the ability to rely on our own industrial base to ensure our national security. Concerns about China's uh, increased footprint started in Africa 20 years ago. Do you find any similarities with the Belt and Road Initiative that we're seeing now in Europe? I sometimes tell my European friends that the Chinese are pursuing a global imperial project. Africa is just the first step. It's economic penetration, debt for equity, loans coming in for which the Chinese then acquire real assets when the repayment is not possible. But what goes side by side with that is also building of Chinese military presence. The Chinese are operating now a naval base in Djibouti. The Chinese are present uh, increasingly in the Mediterranean. And I would argue they're planning to do the same in the high north, in the Arctic, and of course in the Indo-Pacific, where the greatest pressure is building up today. Well, thank you, Dean Mikta. Let's move to Russia. Please give us the big picture. What are the main concerns? The principal concern, in my view, is a Russian determination to revise the post-Cold War international settlement. Uh, Russia is determined to restore a sphere of privileged influence along the per periphery of the Russian Federation itself, but predominantly what used to be the part of the Soviet Union. This includes Ukraine, this includes Belarus, and this also includes competing for influence inside the NATO perimeter. That means not just the flank countries, but deep into Europe. Russia is back, determined to become a principal European power. Russia doesn't want to work with the European Union as a whole. It wants to have bilateral relationships and only with the largest states in the European Union. Very similar to what we're seeing with China in Europe. So there's a lot of discussion about there about alliances between Russia and China. Is it a fact or fiction? I think it's a fact, and whether you call it an alliance or alignment, it's basically coincidence of interests. 
China and Russia are both opposed to continued to, to, to the United States and the United States influence, uh, both in their regions and worldwide. So it's the old adage, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Whether or not the Chinese are equal partners for the Russians or in fact will dominate Russia going forward, that's an open question. Henry Kissinger, in his 2001 book titled Does America Need a Foreign Policy, wrote that, and I'm paraphrasing here, globalization has deepened economic ties on both sides of the Atlantic inextricably. And yet, at the same time, North America and Europe are beset by controversy. That was Kissinger's take back in 2001. What are your thoughts in 2021? I think Kissinger perhaps was right 20 years ago. Um, I think today we live in a very different environment where our starry-eyed assumptions about globalization creating then uh, the foundation of systemic transformation, democratization, you know, the kind of larger global identity and the, the decline of nation states as the organizing principles of international affairs, all of this is now being questioned. I also think the extent to which different national interests uh, on both sides of the Atlantic are become, beginning to assert themselves is going to play a very important role going forward. Uh, I think we're at an inflection point in great power competition. If the West comes together, reaches consensus of some kind, at least comes as close as possible to a consensus on China, on, on the threat China poses, and on Russia, what the Russian game is in Europe and in Eurasia, then I think the West has all the resources to prevail, both technological, population, military, across the board. But if we are continuing to fracture uh, in terms of our particular interests, and we have seen some indications of that, uh, the most visible, the recent signing of the comprehensive agreement on investment between the European Union and China, without close coordination with the American allies, and in fact, very close, just a few weeks before the new Biden administration was sworn in. Um, that signifies to me that there's a lot of divergence in how the Europeans and the Americans, for instance, view China. We look at China as a military and an economic problem set. The Europeans recognize the strategic challenge that China poses, but at the same time, they see it as a tremendous economic opportunity. As you well know, the latest buzz in policy circles in Europe is the topic of advancing European strategic autonomy. And I'm looking for three quick takeaways from you. First, why do you think this idea is becoming so popular? Do you think it is grounded in reality or is it simply aspirational? And how should the US react? Let me take your second question first, if I may. Uh, I don't think this is grounded in reality. Uh, I think this is more a reflection of the internal political dynamic in the European Union. With the departure of the United Kingdom post-Brexit, the European Union today is much more continental than it has ever been since the 1970s. Uh, as a result, it, it is also a, a place now where the principal states, I'm talking about France especially, are jockeying for position. Uh, and I think the French pushing for strategic autonomy are trying to gain an upper hand in that new emerging Europe. I'll be very frank, I think strategic autonomy not only is a questionable strategic concept, but it's quite frankly a potential waste of resources. The Europeans should be investing in their military capabilities within the North Atlantic Treaty Organization so that we as a transatlantic community can have the means to respond in a crisis. Unfortunately, uh, talking about strategic autonomy is a distraction. It takes us away from this principal goal of resourcing the European military to increase its ability to deter and if need be, defend themselves if aggression were to take place. To your point, uh, President Biden in his virtual speech at the Munich Security Conference hit on some key themes such as America is back, the transatlantic alliance is back, and that our alliance is the foundation of our collective security and prosperity. And yet we know that the transatlantic community is faced with unprecedented challenges. So let me ask you, if you are able to design a forcing function to make the transatlantic community more powerful, what would that be? 
I would put China at the top of the agenda. I think if we don't reach an agreement across the Atlantic on the nature of this threat, we will continue to fragment, we will continue to have divergent security optics, and I think in the end, we will prove ourselves unable to respond uh, as an alliance jointly. Uh, the second issue I would put on the agenda would be uh, the rebuilding of Europe's militaries. I am not actually in favor of the 2% of GDP argument that we have heard so much about. I think it's become so politicized that it's borderline distracting us from what the real issues are. What I would have preferred to see, and I think this is what I would urge uh, a, our allies to consider, is to look at different countries committing themselves to developing specific capabilities so that the sum total of what NATO brings together would create the kind of joint force that the alliance needs. If we continue talking about 2% of GDP spent on defense, we're not really addressing the issue. That 2% on, of GDP on defense can be spent on road building, can be spent on salaries, can be spent on the myriad of things, uh, none of which will necessarily increase our ability to defend ourselves. We need to understand that we are in the era of great power competition across the entire spectrum. Should we also include resilience out there? Absolutely. And I'm talking here about democratic resilience too. Absolutely. You know, look, we're, we're looking, uh, our, our current modernization program, our strategy for, for modernization for the U.S. Army is to come, come up with a, a multi-domain joint force uh, by 2035, a force that is capable of fighting in a multi-domain environment. The Europeans have to be modernizing themselves if for no other reason than to remain interoperable with the US forces. We cannot have a situation where America is moving rapidly into new technologies and the Europeans are not following uh, in, a, in a way that allows them to work jointly with American forces. This is a critical national security imperative this is what we should be talking about, practical things, practical capabilities, so that in the event there is a kinetic crisis elsewhere, uh, Europe can stand on its own with America's support at the strategic level with U.S. nuclear security guarantees and enablers, but providing the core of European military. Thank you, Dr. Mikta. Last question for you. You know better than anyone that the Marshall Center is a unique German-American partnership. As Dean of the college, how do you envision the Marshall Center making a greater impact in regard to both German-American relations and the transatlantic community? I'm really glad you asked this question, Val. Our goal going forward will be to build and expand the network of professionals, both civilian and military, working across our area of responsibility, both on regional and transnational security issues. I believe our mission will be even more focused on building those networks so that we can work jointly with our allies and partners. So to our alumni, please stay in touch with us, stay connected, engage with us, participate in our alumni events. And when COVID finally ends, I so look forward to welcoming you to Garmisch again and to the Marshall Center. Dr. Mikta, thank you very much for this interview. We were honored to have you with us today. Thank you, Valbona, it's my pleasure. And this concludes today's episode of the Marshall Center Voices. Until next time, stay safe and well.